Good morning and welcome. The piano player caught me talking and I didn't light the candles before she started playing. That's the challenge that we have each week. So she beat me this week. Not that we're keeping score or anything. Um, typo in the bulletin. There has to be one. Um, Laura's dad, Mr. Stanbridge, has not named Rich. His name is David. And I don't know why I put Rich, other than the fact that my name's David and my dad's name is Rich. So I thought it was Laura's dad, so he must be Rich too. And <laughs> I looked, I talked to Hilda, and I said, it's David. And she said, yes. She said, why do you have Rich? And I said, do I? <laughs> I don't know. So that is, that is my typo on there. Um, things that are coming up, the 28th Building and Grounds uh, meeting here at the church at 7 p.m., uh, September 3rd is the deacons meeting that's scheduled, but that's Labor Day weekend, so we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Uh, September, September 10th is this business meeting. Uh, the 19th is the community meal. Um, Operation Christmas Childs, I have the official note now. It's on an a, uh, index card. We have enough composition books, pencil sharpeners, and washcloths. Still need crayons and computer papers for drawing. Um... We do have the new Mature Living is in the back. September is on the table. August and previous are in the racks in the back. If I put this in here, somebody will get it someday. Um, so we have those. There's also a cake in the back if you are interested in that after church. Um, come and eat some cake. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything? Bible study is this week. Choir is this week. All right, we're back on for those. Um, the l committee list is in the back. Um, if Instead of in lieu of a nominating committee, we're going to keep the committees the same. If you're on the same committee, if you don't want to be on a committee, just go and cross your name off. If you want to be on a, a new committee, put your name in that committee. So it's back there, and that's how we're going to do. In the middle of September, we'll pick it up and make any adjustments that we need to. Also, if you want to be on the email list for news and anything like that, that is back there. Also, you can put your name on there, and there's a bunch of uh, pens back there for you to do that. All right, and I have one more. We have, as you can see, we have a bunch of books up here. Kevin is donating books to our church library. And I'm going to go through the list that he has here. Uh, Growing Strong in the Seasons of Life by Charles Swindoll. Haley's Bible uh, Handbook. How Great is Our God? A classic writing from history's greatest Christian thinkers. Uh, it's a day book of 365 readings. The Key to Personal Peace by Billy Graham. Peace with God by Billy Graham. My Heart's Cry, Longing for More of Jesus by Anne Graham Lotz. Morning Prayers. Evening Prayers, Smith's Bible uh, Dictionary, The Biblical Word, an Illustrated Atlas by John Pierre Isbots, uh, The New Layman's Parallel Bible, The New Jerusalem Bible, The Gift of Forgiveness by Charles Stanley, The Strength of My Strength by Charles Stanley, and The Wisdoms of Psalms. And he's donating those in the memory of his mother and stepfather, Melba and Calvin Collier. Any other announcements? If not, we are going to sing Holy, 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 number two. So if you'll stand and sing, please.
Good morning and welcome to Beulah Baptist Church. If you're out there on the web, we're coming to you live from downtown Lyles, Virginia. So glad you're all with us. Got a little story for you this morning. There was a pastor in a small church, and he come to work one Monday morning to work on this sermon for the following weekend. And he pulled into the parking lot, and there's a dead mule laying in the parking lot. So he goes in, and he calls the police department or the sheriff's department, they send a man out, and they said, well, you know, it's no foul play. Nothing we can do. They suggested that he call the health department. So he called the health department, and they sent a person out, and they looked at this mule, and they determined that the mule just died of old age, no health concerns. So they suggested, Pastor, why don't you call the sanitation department? Maybe they'll come and pick him up. So we called the sanitation department, and, and they said, well, you know, we have to have permission from the mayor. We can't just come out and pick up a mule, so you'll have to go see the mayor. Well, this kind of bothered the pastor a little bit because he knew the mayor, and he knew the mayor was a cantankerous person. But anyway, he goes to see him, and the mayor gets upset. And uh, finally he says, well, look, pastor, it's your job to bury the dead. What do you want me to do? So the pastor sat there, and he said a little silent prayer. And he said, yes, mayor, it's my job to bury the dead, but I'm here today to consult with the family. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, do, I'll try to do better. Tell your dad I'll try to do better. <laughs> I'm glad each and every one of you are here today, and please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning. Lord, I thank you for each and every one here this morning. Be with us. Send your spirit to be with us and be with our pastor this morning. And Lord, we just love you, and we thank you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And we're going to sing? Come, Christians, join the sing. Come, Christians, join the sing. Please stand. Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. Um, we are entering our prayer time, and I know of a few. Uh, David has already mentioned uh, David Stanbridge, who, to my knowledge, remains at VCU and may be there for a little while. You know he had surgery this week. That was successful, and the last time I communicated with Laura, things were looking up, and they were very encouraged that uh, he was taken care of, uh, though his recovery may take a while. Um, I also want to mention we've been praying for the sister of my friend Barbara. Barbara's watching. Good morning, Barbara. I'm glad you're out there. Um, her sister, Joanne Restrepo, 
We've been uh, pr praying for her for a few weeks because she's got an aneurysm, in fact, several. She's having her first surgery on Tuesday. So please keep her on your prayer list. I'm sure Barbara will keep me updated about her. Um, but it's a very serious surgery, and she has multiple aneurysm surgeries in her future. Um, and so we want to continue to pray for her. Um, you know that Ron Lane, Ken's son, is... As far as I know, does anybody know otherwise? Is he still in the hospital, as far as we know? Right? We're hoping he's going to be discharged in the very near future. Um, but he, he does have surgery scheduled for Friday. I guess he'll probably be there through then. Do you know? Probably stay in the hospital through Friday. Um, and he's having surgery then. And Ken has got a whole lot going on because he and Susie are, are either in Lynchburg or on their way down that way because of his granddaughter, Karen's daughter, Lainey, is having, uh, giving birth uh, tomorrow, and so Susie's here to help with them and with that, and Ken is down there, and so he's been traveling between here and Manassas, where Ron is, and now Lynchburg, and then he'll be coming home, we think, for a day or two after the birth before, of his great-grandchild before he goes back to Manassas for Ron's surgery later this week. So that's a mouthful, and I'm exhausted thinking about that. But I bet we may have some other requests in our midst this morning. So what is on your heart and mind today? Kelly. I didn't hear who. Pippin. Pippin had major surgery on Friday, and we're praying for Pippin to uh, recover. And if you don't know that, Pippin is Kelly's dog. Some of us were talking this morning. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, chatter on social media uh, uh, of, of a shooting overnight uh, on the Northern Neck. Um, I don't have very many details except this is the second incident where uh, uh, violence was uh, prevalent in the last week uh, on the Northern Neck. You know that there was a shooting in Warsaw earlier this week and at least one person has died from that shooting. I believe more than one person was injured. I'm not certain. I know that there were people taken to Tappanic and then... Uh, uh, one of whom did not survive. Um, and so there's a, seems to be an outbreak of violence. I don't know if it's an outbreak or what to call it, except there have been at least two shootings recently, and uh, many of us are concerned about that. Other things that might be on your heart this morning. Praises? Yes, sir. Robert. Robert is thankful that his mother has come home. She has been weak, but uh, we're glad that she's home, glad she, where she can be where she wants to be. We need to continue to pray for her. Kelly. I don't know if you all heard that, but Debbie, Debbie Van Landingham is online, and she asked us to pray for her uncle, Marshall, who is having neck surgery on Tuesday. He's got some limited mobility, and they're praying that that surgery will correct that for him. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so Hilda's uh, brother, Marshall, will be having shoulder replacement surgery on Thursday. Thank you for that. I'd like to say that I am thankful for David Driggs in spite of his stories. I just like it when he tells a story about a preacher and it's obvious that he's not talking about me. There's no jokebooks up there. What am I going to do? 
there are no joke books up here. That is true. My mother, these books were all from my mother's library. And um, um, anyway, happy to, uh, they, they find a good home here. Kelly. Uh, Linda and Everett are watching online, and congratulations on your 54th wedding anniversary. We're so happy for you and proud of you for that accomplishment, that milestone. And uh, they wanted us to know that Curie Omen Baptist Church uh, is hosting the Millers in concert this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And they say they are very good, so they want us to be aware of them, and maybe some of us will be able to go. Thank you for that. Donnie. What the first time? Oh, okay. Okay. About meeting assistance, and then he went to a class reunion, and he did all this without his wife there. So, yeah. Sure. Well, we praise God that your dad is doing so well. If you didn't hear that out there, Donnie was saying that uh, he has. Uh, his dad has been on a camping trip up in Madison, and uh, we're celebrating that, that excursion for him and uh, class reunion and several things. So trying to get out there, live life. Right. Absolutely. I never know when my phone buzzes in my pocket, whether it's a prayer request from my wife, who's watching probably, but or it's business. <clears throat> so let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this day. We thank you for calling us here, for this place, for this family of faith. God, I thank you for each person who's watching online, for Kristen and Barbara, for Linda and Everett, and for all those whose names I didn't catch because they weren't on by the time I checked it. God, we pray that you continue to pour out your love and your healing on Joanne Restrepo. We can't begin to know the depth of all of her needs, but we know that you know. We pray that you pour out your grace on her and her family. God, be with David Stanbridge. Be with Laura and all of the Stanbridge family. As he continues to recover from his surgery, we thank you for your grace in his life, for the love that you show him through all of his family, children and grandchildren, for the care that they and the medical team can provide. God, we are thrilled to get a good report for Ron Lane and pray that you would continue to be with him as he anticipates surgery on Friday. Some of us have a hard time imagining a one-hour surgery and Ron's looking at a 10-hour surgery. But he's got you. So we pray that you would minister your grace to him, your healing to him, your comfort, your peace. To Ron and all of those who love him, both his wife and children and, and his father and sisters, and just pray that you'd be with them. God, pray that you would give Ken stamina as he travels back and forth from here to Manassas, to Lynchburg, to 
here to Manassas and makes that big long triangle. God be with Lainey as she prepares to give birth tomorrow. We pray for the baby. We pray for her. We pray for her mother Karen. Pray for her aunt Susie. All of whom care for her deeply. Pray for Ken as they love her and anticipate this new life. God be with Kelly and with Pippin. Comfort them both, we pray. We thank you for our pets, for the love they show us and how they are probably as close as anything we'll ever see to um, your unconditional love this side. God be with Debbie's Uncle Marshall. We pray that his surgery on Tuesday goes well. We all have our aches and pains. We are mindful whenever we can have a surgery that might render some aid that we that we we just pray for him and pray that that uh, surgery is effective and and helps his mobility be with all who love him debbie tommy the rest of the family god be with hilda's brother marshall as he anticipates shoulder surgery on thursday we're thankful that there are medical means and surgical means out there for our needs for treating pains in necks and pains in shoulders. God, we're thankful for Robert's mother coming home so that she can be where she wants to be. Pray that you would strengthen her in her weakness, that you would give her your peace that passes all understanding. God, we celebrate with Linda and Everett their 54 years of marriage. God, we pray that you would continue to bless them and keep them, sustain them, that they continue to be an inspiration to the rest of us for the love they share, for the, the Christian walk that they enjoy. God, we are feel relatively comfortable, though a bit cool here this morning. And we are mindful that there are those who are grieving this day from violent acts that have occurred in our community. God, we pray for the injured in body and in spirit. We pray for your peace, your tranquility, your hope for each person involved. Pray for your grace and your will. God, we celebrate with Donnie that his dad is, is uh, living life and, and learning how to live again as a widower. Seeking out activities that he's enjoyed in the past. Pray that you would continue to bless him and be with him and inspire him and inspire us through him. God, we pray for Curie Omen Baptist Church this morning for the concert they're going to hold this afternoon. Bless the Millers and all who are able to hear them. God, thank you for being there for us in our hurts, in our struggles, in our frustrations, in our labors, in our grief. May we have your grace to sustain us this day and every day with all that we face as we try to be your children the way you'd have us to be. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is Living for Jesus. Please stand with me and let's sing together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. And Lord, we just ask you to receive this offering back in your, in your order, for your honor and glory, Lord, and use it to uh, further your kingdom. While you remain standing, if you'll take your pew Bible, you can turn to page 693, and we can all read along together. We're going to read chapter 15, verses 10 through 28. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Verse 12. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, Explain this parable to us. Verse 16, Jesus said, Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth from the heart, these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean, but eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession." Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. 
The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Jesus replied to her, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Can you think of some things that come in pairs? How about socks or shoes or gloves? Maybe even parentheses. You never see, a, you never see a, a, an open parentheses without a closed parentheses, or at least you shouldn't. It's a typo otherwise. David, you can do that next week. Maybe you see two, two things that come together. It might be aspirin or Tylenol or Motrin, you know, like... Take two and call me in the morning, or points in basketball. I ask about pairs because I want you to think about this text for today as two parts of a whole. Some of us sort of thought when I finished the first story, that was the end, but it wasn't the end. Bookends need one on either side to hold up the books. Parentheses. This is a story that really needs both halves. Um, in the first story, Matthew tells us of the story of defilement and misunderstanding within the house of Israel. The Pharisees and scribes, Jesus, uh, uh, about his disciples, they, they challenge him about his disciples, whether they wash their hands or don't before they're eating. Jesus offers a completely different understanding of defilement. Then he explains himself to the disciples. That's in the first story. We'll come back to that in just a minute. In the second half of this story, we get another feeding story of sorts. It's replete with tables and food and crumbs and healing. That almost sounds make it sounds like the Lord's Supper, but that's a bit of a serious twist. We hear Jesus in the second story saying words that sound harsh, that sound like, well, that doesn't even sound like the Jesus I know. I'm here for the children of Israel. Shouldn't give the food to the children. Shouldn't give that to the dogs. But in all of this, Jesus' disciples struggle uh, to understand. And in that second story, they don't even make an appearance at all. I want to offer some thoughts that maybe you've considered before or maybe you've not. He's focusing. We'll talk through the whole text but, but in that second story, I think, there's a, I think there's some truth there for us that I have not heard very often before. Have you ever heard a story preached or heard a sermon preached on that second half of that text where Jesus is harsh to that woman? I, I, I don't recall many sermons or Sunday school lessons on that text. And I think it's important that whenever we find texts that we don't hear very often, we make sure we pay attention to them. So backing up to the beginning, when the text opens today, Jesus is responding to the Pharisees and the scribes who challenged Jesus and especially his disciples' behavior back at the very first part of the chapter, chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. The first thing to notice is that the scribes and Pharisees have come from Jerusalem to Galilee to confront Jesus. That's a really long way. They've, they've traveled 80 or so miles just so they can get in Jesus' face and, and challenge him about the fact that his disciples weren't washing their hands whenever they walked through a grain field or whenever they, they're, they're, they're concerned about their rules and their ceremonial cleanliness. Um, they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Uh, the Pharisees and scribes and the elders they referenced, they challenged Jesus and his unconventional followers. Let me just pause there and say, do you remember what Jesus said was the greatest commandment? Love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor. And, and there's one likened to it. 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. The, there's the greatest commandment and one like unto it. And those are the two greatest commandments. Jesus spoke those words, right? When did those start being the greatest commandments? Were they great? Uh, were they great until he spoke them, or had they always been the greatest commandments that just nobody had ever figured that out? That's rhetorical. You don't have to speak that answer. Thank you for playing along and offering some answers on on the other part. You know, it strikes me that the scribes and Pharisees liked religious control, and they created all kinds of rules and rituals that they started demanding that everybody follow, irrespective of what was the greatest commandment, whether Jesus had spoken it yet or not, right? So we have in this text the religious leaders, once again, trying to impose their religious code, their rules and regulations on Jesus' disciples, about defilement. That is, you need to be ceremonially clean before you can eat. Now, um, I'm going off my notes or I'm away from my notes, and I may stumble here just a little bit, but I think about just a minute, who would be able to be ceremonially unclean and who wouldn't be? See, there's a lot of farmers around us around here and in this region of Virginia, and the farmers, maybe sheep farmers, but farmers, uh, sheep herders would have a hard time being clean. There are a whole lot of vocations, occupations that are implied or that were necessary part of commerce and necessary part of culture that would never be able to be ceremonially unclean. And who, and who were Jesus' disciples? Well, a lot of them were fishermen. And yet the Pharisees and the scribes created all manner of rules and rituals that they could keep because they could pay somebody else to be unclean. And then they would call them unclean and want to stay away from them. You get the picture? Back to our text over and over in Matthew, whenever Jesus says something like, listen and understand, he's about to say the opposite of what the scribes and Pharisees are trying to teach. He does not disappoint in verse 11 whenever he says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles. When he says this, Jesus is addressing what the scribes and Pharisees imply by their initial question about the disciples not washing their hands before eating in the first couple of verses of the chapter. Do you ever wonder if Jesus or how much Jesus grew weary of his audience or even his disciples misunderstanding him, misunderstanding God's intention with the Ten Commandments or the greatest commandments. They made so many rules that uh, people couldn't follow and then declared themselves clean because they could follow them. Sounds like stacking the deck to me. Listen and understand, Jesus said. In text after text that we've examined and many we haven't yet, Jesus addresses their hearing and understanding. How many times did Jesus say, let them who have ears hear? A bunch in the Sermon on the Mount alone. In text after text, the disciples then, after Jesus says such a thing or offers a parable, the disciples either in front of everybody or secretly later, they come around and say, what, what did you really mean? Could, could you explain that to me? Because I didn't understand what you were talking about. We've heard sermon after sermon our whole lives of how Jesus used parables that everyone would understand. And it seems to me like hardly anybody ever understood any of them. Verse 12. When the disciples hear Jesus, they are initially worried about what the Pharisees think. Here's the text. Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said we've read and spoken of Jesus compassion in recent weeks how Jesus fed 5,000 men plus the women and children just because he was compassionate because he thought they might be hungry this week the disciples almost seem to be accusing Jesus of being insensitive dude weren't you aware that you upset the Pharisees and I'm can you imagine what Jesus was thinking again 
I can't speak without upsetting the Pharisees. Why, why, is, why is that? That's not news. They, the disciples worried about his offending them. Jesus had no such concern. By the way, if you didn't already know that, this story, this same story appears in the Gospel of Mark. But in Mark, the disciples don't express any concern whatsoever about the Pharisees. They simply ask Jesus to explain what he meant. Um, the way Mark tells it, um, he makes the disciples seem to be completely clueless. Matthew, in Matthew, they seem to get the message eventually. If you want to check this out after the service, see Mark 7, verses 14 and following. It may be simply... It may simply be that the different gospel authors have different purposes. We talk about that from time to time. Matthew, as you know, was writing primarily for a Jewish audience who needed to understand Jesus in light of the Old Testament, particularly Old Testament prophecy. Mark was likely writing to a predominantly Gentile audience who would not necessarily understand the Jewish culture and religion in the first place, so he didn't need to go over those prophecies. Back to Matthew, verse 13. Jesus continues, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides, speaking back of the Pharisees and scribes. Let them alone. They're blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. When Jesus speaks these words, he's responding to the, the disciples' concern for the Pharisees. He seems to be saying that there is something illegitimate about the Pharisees, or perhaps illegitimate about their laws. The disciples expressed concern that the Pharisees were offended. Jesus says, Every plant in my in my, that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Jesus seems to be calling the Pharisees plants not planted by the Father. Think about that for just a minute. Religious leaders, people who are in religious authority, leading services, preaching, teaching, the crowd, the community, and Jesus says, well, they aren't, these are plants that my heavenly Father didn't even plant. Then Jesus calls them blind guides, offering the basis from which we get the phrase, the blind leading the blind. According to Matthew, it's at this point that Peter, not all the disciples, but Peter specifically asks Jesus to explain what he's been saying. Verse 16, we see Jesus ask Peter, are you also still without understanding? Now, context is everything. And let me just remind you, one of the things we talked about last week was that Peter, the story that precedes this one is Peter walking on the water, albeit for a short distance or for a short time before he looked down and he realized what he was doing and then he started to sink through his lack of faith. But what happened when they got back in the boat? Do you remember? All the people in the boat worshiped Jesus because he's been wa walking on water and what did they say? Truly, you are the Son of God. And now, Peter's asking Jesus, Would you, could you help me understand what you just said there? Because I, I, I just don't quite get it. As a result of Peter's inquiry, Jesus offers, a, I'll call it a rudimentary biology lesson. Verse 17. Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth goes into the stomach and then goes out into the sewer, one, one translation says. But what comes out of the mouth, what... Uh, proceeds from the mouth it proceeds from the heart and this is what defiles for out of the heart come evil intentions murder slander uh, adultery fornication theft false witness and all sorts of evil things these are what defile a person but to eat with unwashed hands that does not defile in his words in verse 20, Jesus finally offers his rebuttal to the Pharisees' challenge in verse 2. Have you ever heard um, the phrase about a certain road being paved with good intentions? Right. Well, in this verse, Jesus says, out of the heart come evil intentions. Jesus is saying that a person may eat with dirty hands without spiritually contaminating oneself. But one may not think and act on evil intentions with impunity. Acting on evil intentions, he, do, uh, uh, he, he implies, does defile a person. Within Matthew's record of the gospel, this is the end of the first bookend. But we still need to get the other half of the story. And why is that important? 
Well, as much trouble as Jesus' disciples had of understanding him, Jesus had a hard time explaining himself in a way that they could understand. And this is where um, I'm going to offer an interpretation of the second half of, this, of these two stories. Context is everything. Why do these things, why do these stories, why does the second story follow the first story? I wonder. I wonder if Jesus was exasperated with his disciples and with his followers for not really getting what seemed so obvious. What if, what if Jesus took it on himself to say something? They don't get it. Explain it. They don't get it. Tell a story about it. They don't get it. Use a metaphor, a parable. They don't get it. Some of you are educators, maybe more than the two I'm pointing at. An alternative way is to create a life lesson. Go find something, go find something that happened in real life and use that right here, right now. Finding it, we call that a teachable moment, right? What if the second story, the second bookend, the second sock, the second Advil, what if the second part of this, the second story, is um, a life lesson? Matthew 20, uh, verse 21 in chapter 15. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now I need to point out that Jesus has been healing and preaching throughout Galilee. Now he heads for the Mediterranean beach towns of Tyre and Sidon. This is outside of Israel. This is outside of the places that we would find normally find Jews. He's going into a foreign country, a foreign district, a foreign region... And we shouldn't be surprised if he finds people who aren't Jews here. And what happens? Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Now, I don't know if you find it fascinating that a Canaanite woman knows that Jesus comes from the lineage of King David, but the scribes and Pharisees can't seem to figure that out. We've talked about that in Bible study recently. That, that well, who are you? Well, he can't be from the tribe of David. He's from, he's from Nazareth. He, can't, he, they, he would have to come from Bethlehem. And here's a Canaanite woman in a foreign land, and she's got it all figured out. And the people he's talking to on a regular basis just can't figure it out. Verse 23, Matthew says that Jesus did not even respond to the woman when she approached him. Now, I don't know about you, but that just does not sound like the Jesus that I know. Why would he do that? Why would he, Here is a man filled with compassion, enough so that f a few days ago, we don't know how many, but a few days ago, he fed 5,000 men plus the women and children because he was compassionate that they were suffering and hungry. Now, here is a Canaanite woman who shows up and begs him, identifies him as son of David. Won't you heal my daughter? And he just ignores her. What if there's a life lesson here? The disciples, however, having been born and bred and lived through the teaching of the Pharisees and the teaching of Jesus, well, they took note of her, but they didn't express any compassion or, or, or see any compassion either. They were following the Jewish rules the rules of the scribes and Pharisees. They wanted Jesus to send this woman away because she's just bothering us. She's creating a ruckus. She's harassing us. She's making all kinds of racket, and we don't want her around. Now, before you ask, no, I don't know what Jesus is thinking. No, I don't know why he did not respond with compassion initially. And Matthew doesn't tell us, at least not yet. But in 24, he continues saying, Jesus answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Does that sound like a Pharisee's rule to you? What if Jesus is just trying to create a life lesson for his closest followers where, well, the Pharisees tell me I've got to wash my hands ceremonially. I've got to do all these things. I've got to do rule, 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 rule. This does not sound as though Jesus is loving his neighbor as self. Maybe he's going to. It just sounds harsh right now, though. Verse 25, the woman is not dissuaded, but she came and knelt before him. Lord, help me. 
Jesus answered again, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now, you may or may not know that Jesus' statement reflects a cultural context where dog or dogs were sometimes used metaphorically to refer to Gentiles. It still sounds too harsh to my ears. It doesn't sound like the Jesus we know. It certainly looks like Jesus is calling the woman a dog. And some of us may have heard a sermon or we, you know, I don't know. But Jesus, this great emancipator of women, comes across calling the Canaanite woman a dog. Some have called this verse an illustration of the testing of the woman's faith. Uh, she responds with humility and faith, and Jesus commends her for her great faith and heals her daughter. You know, some folks also say, well, she persuades Jesus to be compassionate. I don't buy that. Jesus doesn't need anybody to be, persuade him to be compassionate. We've already seen evidence of Jesus' compassion. But we also have seen Jesus teach through method after method after method after method. What if this story is illustrating something of commentary about the prior story? Verse 28, Jesus answered the woman, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. He says, Woman, of great is your faith. He hadn't even said that about his disciples yet. They're the ones who called him son of God. They, but they're saying it, but they don't quite live it yet. They don't have the depth of faith that this foreign woman has, this non-Jewish woman has. I think that's pretty remarkable. When it's all said and done, the fact that the woman was a Gentile made no difference to Jesus. I wonder, who are the Gentiles in our lives? Who are the Canaanite women in our lives? Who are the outcasts around us who have needs? If these two stories are necessary bookends where both are needed to understand, what does all that mean for us? We've got the first half of rules. We're supposed to follow these rules. The, the Pharisees have lined out all of these rules above and beyond the faith. And what does Jesus say globally about the faith? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And what is he doing with the disciples when they don't understand, they don't understand, they don't understand, they don't understand? He puts a life lesson right in front of them where he illustrates the rules and then he illustrates his and God's compassion. Where are you today? Where are we today? Where is Beulah today? Are we concerned about playing by the rules? Or are we concerned with loving neighbor as ourself, loving God as our Lord, and loving neighbor as ourself? Are we more concerned that somebody might defile themselves in ways that we consider defiling? Rules that we've made? Somebody told us somewhere, oh, that's a rule, we have to follow that. Well, from what I've gathered from the New Testament, the rules I really want to follow, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else falls away by comparison. Won't you pray with me? God of compassion. God of love. God who speaks to us through your word. May we see the gospel as you have revealed it to us this day. Where Jesus takes an unexpected turn. Where he behaves in an unexpected way. Where he goes to an outlying region taking an unexpected turn. But if we see him in context, we see him perfectly consistent 
with the compassionate Savior we know him to be. God, speak to us, and may we have ears to hear. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. At this time each week, we sing a hymn we call a hymn of decision. It's an opportunity for anyone here or anyone watching now or later to respond to the gospel message, to join this church, to be received here in baptism or by letter or other means, to dedicate one's life to Christ, to rededicate oneself. It's during the singing of this hymn that we traditionally receive that membership. Um, if you want to respond to us online, feel free to reach out to us. I hope you will. If you want to meet me here and for, if you'd like us, me to pray with you, I'd be more than delighted to do that as well. While we stand and sing, take the name of Jesus with you. Please stand. Please pray with me. God, go with us, we pray. May we have the good sense to take the name of Jesus with us, to be the children of God in this world the way you would have us to be, offering your grace to all of the Canaanite women and men in whom we come in contact, with whom we come in contact. Go with us now. In your name we pray. Amen.